So I'd like to go ahead and introduce our keynote. It is a real treat to have with us today our keynote. He is someone who's renowned in the field of risk communication and in many ways responsible for the growth of the field of risk and crisis communication, not in small part due to the number of graduate students he's had, 40 some? Do doctoral students that he has advised. And he's been a faculty member and administrator at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan for 34 years. He currently serves as Dean of the College of Fine Performing and Communication Arts. His research spans crisis and risk communication, health promotion and communication, crisis response and agency coordination, the role of media, including new media, crisis and communication ethics. He can tell you a lot of stories about that. Failure of complex systems and post-crisis renewal. Now, he could spend hours talking to us about any aspect of risk and crisis communication, but I only gave him 45 minutes. <laughs> so his charge, his charge for us today is to share an overview of the elements of risk and crisis communication and get us thinking or rethinking about how we can apply these in our work. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Matt Seeger. Wayne State University is in the middle of Detroit. It is not an ag school. Um, so most of my work has been in the area of crisis and risk communication as manifest in public health. I've worked very extensively with the CDC, the World Health Organization, uh, FEMA, Homeland Security on a variety of different projects. A project I just most recently completed was the Flint water crisis. And if you have a month, I can tell you just a few things about the Flint water crisis, which was really quite an amazing story. I do have a little bit of a background in ag. I grew up in an agricultural community in, in northern Indiana. And one of my most memorable uh, experiences was working for a vet when I was 12 and 13. It was the era of child labor, so he paid me very poorly, but uh, he got good work out of me, old Doc Allison. And one of my most memorable moments as a, a veterinarian assistant was the week I spent at the sale barn vaccinating and castrating hogs. And that image will stick with me the rest of my life. Uh, Doc Allison was very supportive. He you know, s explained to me that this really didn't hurt the pigs very much and, and they really didn't need these anyway. And then he leaned over to me, leaned close, and he said, and you know, this is what we need to do sometimes to keep young men under control. So you remember that. I internalized that message. That was a sticky message and that stuck with me for a very, very long period of time. So um, the question that, uh, Julie, yes. Will you put that story in? <laughs> Happy to put that story in. Um, so uh, Julie asked me to answer this question or address this question today. You know, how, do com how does communication both the sending and receiving of messages, uh, it, how do we communicate so that appropriate actions and behaviors can be implemented to protect the agricultural community? And I want to emphasize sending and receiving because this is not just a, a, a process of sending out a message, it's also about receiving information in. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I'm going to try to address this, uh, this question with four points. Uh, uh, a, 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 I'm going to talk a little bit about a crisis and risk communication approach. And this particular approach comes from the Centers for Disease Control. As I said, I've worked extensively with the Centers for Disease Control for many years. And the Centers for Disease Control was one of the real leaders in developing a public health approach to crisis and emergency risk communication. The CDC, the CDC following the anthrax episode, the anthrax letter episode, which some of you may remember, produced this document. And it is a very, very comprehensive document, which is available on the CDC website. This is probably the most uh, useful, hands-on approach to crisis and emergency risk communication that's available. I, I'll have the link at the end of my slides. This can all be downloaded. It's readily available. There are training modules. It really is a very, very robust resource, and I was, I was delighted to be part of this particular project. I'm going to spend a little time talking about crisis features because I think it's important to understand the conditions we face. I'm going to talk about some risk identification uh, and risk response characteristics, both pre and post events, and then I'm going to talk about crisis uh, communication elements. <clears throat> so let me talk a little bit about this crisis and emergency risk communication framework. As I said, it grew out of 
the 2001 anthrax letter attack where the CDC discovered that A, they had a really big role to play in a crisis response, and B, they had no idea how to do it. And they really messed up uh, in their anthrax letter re uh, response, and so they had to develop a new capacity. They learned from that event and they had to develop a new capacity. The CERC uh, framework is designed to integrate risk communication and crisis communication. Traditionally, we had seen these as two very distinct elements, and uh, the work that I've done with Tim and some others, as well as the CDC, we tried to bring these together and see them as sort of an integrated process. Uh, they also developed a holistic approach to the crisis life cycle, which I'll talk about in just a moment. It's really important to think of a crisis or a risk as sort of a developmental process, which I'll talk about. Uh, and this has been used widely in public health emergencies. This framework has been trained pretty much by every, to every local, state, uh, regional public health unit in the country and even globally and internationally. So it's very, very widely used. <clears throat> Some of the features of a crisis that, that I think are important to, to sort of emphasize is, first of all, these events are surprising, they're unanticipated, and they're uncertain. Now, um, it's also the case that whenever we look at a crisis, we see the, the warning signs in place, and I'll talk about those in a moment, but, but almost by definition, people who are experiencing a crisis will be surprised. Gosh, where did all that water come from? You know, gosh, uh, how did I get sick? You know, there, there, there are always, it's always sort of a surprising element in a crisis, and there are always uh, lots of uncertainties about what's going to happen and what we should do. And that creates really interesting challenges from the communication perspective, because how do you communicate under a condition of high uncertainty? A crisis also is a, is a threat to high priority goals, things that are really important to us, our farms, our families, our livelihood, our communities, those are really important to us and there's some threat to those things. A crisis requires a response, a rapid response, and most often that response has communicative, communicative elements. Uh, the way in which we manage risks and crisis today is largely a communication phenomenon. It's designed to change behaviors so that the risk is reduced. It's complex and cascading, and I have the Daiichi Fukushima uh, uh, disaster here as, a, as an illustration. This is a wonderful illustration of this cascading event. So we had a, a, a her, an earthquake that created a tsunami, which created the, one of the worst radiological episodes we've seen, which was all, also could be understood as an industrial accident. That resulted in an energy crisis in Japan, as well as a food contamination event. So we had it all right there in one package. So we often see these disasters as cascading. Sometimes we talk about the Velcro effect, that a, a crisis sort of drags a lot of other issues forward uh, as part of the crisis. Uh, and there are usually multiple causes associated with a crisis. You know, we like to say, oh, this is the one thing that caused this outbreak of disease, or this is the one thing that caused the Flint water crisis. Crises are almost always a function of many interacting factors. And I think recognizing that is really important to managing these events. So I also like to say a crisis isn't a bad hair day. Um, you know, I had teenagers and, you know, my kids would come in and say, oh, my God, the car won't start. It's a crisis. No, that's not a crisis. A crisis is, is a significant event. And I think it's important that we don't get caught up in sort of the routine uh, 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 issues that we face every day and see them as crisis. A crisis is really more substantive. Substantive. A crisis is also predictable in its evolution, and this is a really important uh, feature of a crisis which can help you all because you can see what is going to happen next in a crisis. You can anticipate what will happen next, what I will have to do, what I will have to say to be able to manage this successfully. And this has been a really important contribution of the research literature because traditionally we've seen a crisis as a one-off. Oh, the water, we had a flood. It was a thousand year flood. That means I won't have to ever deal with this again for a thousand years. Well, of course, that's not what that means. Uh, but, but we typically see these as one off events that we will never have to engage in again, see, uh, look at again. And as a consequence, we haven't really tried to understand how these evolved. But there are now models about how uh, these, these events evolved. Um, I mentioned pre uh, pre precipitated by multiple factors. Crisis also has sort of a shape and a structure. And if you look at different kinds of events, flooding events, infectious disease event events, 
um, you know, nat what we sometimes call natural disasters, technological failures. Each of those events has a particular kind of structure to it or shape. There will be, tic be particular audiences that are involved, particular agencies that are responding. And so if you understand the structure of that particular kind of event, again, you can be empowered to respond much more effectively to that particular event. And a crisis can also be understood as the manifestation of a risk. You all know about a lot of risks out there. I heard about a lot of them today, even over lunch, as people said, well, you know, this tomato doesn't look so good. So actually, the tomatoes were just fine. Um, but, but you know, there are a lot of risks out there. You know about a lot of those risks. You spend your lives managing those risks. You're trying to manage those risks. A crisis is what happens when that risk actually becomes manifest. So this is the crisis life cycle that I mentioned. And this comes from the uh, Crisis and Emergency Risk Communication Framework from the CDC. And this, this I think, in some ways was one of the most important contributions to, uh, to this literature and to the management of a crisis because it really laid out some very specific activities uh, that we can engage in. And I will make the slides available to whoever, whoever wants them, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, <clears throat> this particular model is a five-stage model. There are stage models that are three stages, six stages, nine stages. I think this is a really helpful um, model for understanding how crisis evolves. The first stage is the pre-crisis stage, um, sometimes defined as before it hits the fan. Uh, and this is a stage of normalcy, relative normalcy, where hopefully <clears throat> what you're doing is you're help helping educate people about risks that may be emerging, helping <clears throat> prepare response strategies, developing crisis plans, but this is, this is the, the, the moment where you, you're in a normal situation where you're trying to manage the risks, but yet prepare for what could happen. The second phase is the initial event stage. This is after it hits the fan. Uh, an initial event stage <clears throat> is usually identified by a trigger event, some dramatic occurrence that signals to, to the broader community, now we're in it. Now something bad has happened, and sometimes that's you know a report to the newspaper. Sometimes it's you know massive rainfall and, and flooding. Sometimes it's a call from a, a, a an agency, um, you know. But but it's something that signals that we are no longer in a normal circumstance. And one of the projects Tim and I did many many years ago involved the Fargo floods, and we had we had fun uh, listening to night. Well, not fun. For me, it's fun because uh, this is the kind of person I am. But we listened to 911 tapes, <clears throat> and um, I remember the 911 tape of the elderly woman calling into the local uh, police department saying, uh, I just wish to report, uh, young man, that there is a car floating down the street out in front of my house. And the 911 operator was very kind. He said, ma'am, you know, we're in a major flooding event, and you need to evacuate. And water is rising quite quickly and you need to get to an upper floor of your house if you have one and we'll put you in for evacuation. She said, young man, you don't understand. There is a car floating down the street in my house and that's not normal and something needs to be done about this. So the initial event stage is really this, often this really radical juxtaposition of what is considered normal and where we are now. I mean, people came out of the subways after 9-11 and looked up to try to find the landmark that they used to navigate in lower Manhattan, and it wasn't there. And their whole worldview was, was turned upside down. They didn't know where they were. They didn't know what was going on. They, they were, it was a very uh, 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 radical juxtaposition between what is normal and the circumstances they were in. So the initial event stage is the stage where we seek to manage the uncertainty. We give people response strategies. We usually think about this, that as self-efficacy. Now, I'm going to focus my remarks on those two, first two stages. I'm just going to mention the last three quickly. The maintenance stage is you know, after the harm is contained, uh, so there, no new damage is occurring. There are also uncertainty reduction strategies that go on there and self-efficacy strategies. We may be communicating to people at this stage you know, where they can go to get additional help. The resolution stage is when we've returned to some sense of normalcy. Sometimes it's a new normalcy. And then the final stage is the resolution or the uh, evaluation stage. Hopefully, hopefully we're learning from these events. Hopefully there are after action plans. Hopefully there are efforts to get people together to talk about what have we learned and what we can do. Sadly, we don't do a very good job of learning from crisis. <clears throat> 
So just a couple of uh, examples of some crises that have occurred that really have involved agricultural issues. The Hong Kong avian influenza outbreak in 1997 was one of the first uh, episodes where the CDC had to be involved in the response. And this is one of the cases where people from the CDC came back to the states and said, gee, we're going to have to think about sick chickens now. Uh, it was really a, quite an epiphany for them. The SARS epi epidemic, uh, which actually occurred, began in Asia, <clears throat> actually came to Toronto, and then came to Detroit, of all places, because there's a, a large immigrant community that, that lives in China and uh, in Toronto, and they came across the border in, into Michigan. It was a really interesting episode because the Chinese government wasn't being transparent about what was going on, so we had this emerging disease that people, people knew very little about. That's a real problem because the public health community couldn't recognize it. <clears throat> the H1N1 swine flu <clears throat> episode was one that created a great deal of concern in the public health community. The Ebola pandemic, uh, which is still going on, Really interesting, uh, the misinformation, the rumors, the false information about Ebola have, has really been powerful and has really been one of the defining characteristics of that event. It made it almost impossible to manage. Um, in parts of West Africa, Ebola is considered to be a myth. It's considered to be a plot by the West to you know, destroy uh, the African uh, countries in Africa. So it's a really big challenge based on the misinformation. And Zika, I mean Zika, talk about an interesting one. Here we had a <clears throat> relatively well understood vector-borne disease which uh, emerged and was demonstrated uh, to, and it, they largely contained in one region, comes to the Western Hemisphere, is, is associated with these radical, uh, these awful, awful birth defects, and is also sexually transmitted. So a really complex question in terms of how to manage that particular event. So I have a couple of definitions of risk communication that I'll share with you here. They both come from agencies. The first is from the EPA. Uh, this emphasizes that risk communication is a process. Um, it talks about the science-based approach to communicating effectively. This is a pretty traditional definition of risk communication. really kind of emphasizes the scientist talking to the public, um, which is a very traditional way in which we've done risk communication, not always the most effective. This one I like a little bit more. This comes from the National Research Council, and it describes risk communication as this interactive process. It's not one way, uh, but it involves exchange of opinion among lots of different groups, not just the scientists speaking to the community, but you know, individuals, groups, institutions, agencies, communities. This is all part of the larger risk communication process. <clears throat> so let me break down risk communication in a little more detail. It is complex and dynamic. Please don't think this is easy. It is not. This is hard. This is very, very difficult stuff. And you're, you're going to be working in a very complex communication environment with multiple conflicting messages, with uh, multiple audiences that have different needs. This is a really complex process. It's high consequential. If you get it wrong, bad things happen. And you know there are a number of cases in the research literature of people being told to evacuate into the danger zone where they are exposed to things. Um, you know, the Flint water crisis, we told people for about a year that the water was just fine, keep drinking it. <clears throat> and so the consequences of that are about 6,000 kids were exposed to lead levels that meet the federal definition of poisoning. So, you know, the consequences of getting it wrong are really quite significant. It requires strategic decision making under conditions of high uncertainty. I'm really sorry about this, but the fact that you don't have all the answers doesn't mean that you're alleviated from the responsibility of communicating. You still have to communicate even though you may not have every single fact that you want. As scientists, we want certainty and we want to know exactly what we have before we, uh, we make a statement. But in a crisis situation, you don't have the luxury. I'm sorry about that, but that's one of the realities of risk communication. It's fundamental to managing risks. You know, I've, I've had lots of really fun conversations with the emergency managers who say, well, I don't need to worry about communication. That's not really important to managing a crisis. I'm like, how are you going to get people to evacuate? Well, there is that. So, you know, it, it really is the fundamental process that we use for uh, purposes of managing crisis and risks. Uh, risk communication, I mentioned this earlier, 
uh, is communication about known probabilities of negative consequences and how they can be reduced, that self-efficacy component. Also, uh, messages about what we don't know. This is what we know, but we don't know everything. And this is what we don't know, and this is what we're still trying to figure out. It addresses both the technical, objective understanding of risk and also the emotional and subjective understanding of risk. And it really is that second component, that subjective understanding of risk that motivates behavior. I have a great example of this. I have a new granddaughter. <clears throat> she is uh, just a few weeks old. And I happened to be walking through Detroit Metro Airport uh, a, a few weeks back. At the same time, somebody else who didn't get vaccinated was walking through Detroit Metro Airport and had measles. So my daughter saw this on the television and said, oh, you have the measles. You can't come and see your granddaughter. And I'm like, what? She says, bring me your vaccination records. <laughs> OK. So I spent about a week trying to solve this problem and explaining to her that the probabilities of me having the measles were, were infinitesimal. They were you know, less than, than probably could be measured. You know, it was just absolutely infinitesimal. And besides, you went whitewater rafting when you were six months pregnant. And that was a lot more dangerous than <laughs> me you know, coming in with the supposed measles. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. I had to come to her with a medical test that showed that I was immune before she would let me see my granddaughter. So it's a real good example of how, you know, I'm a risk communication guy. I've been doing this for 40 years. And I can't convince my daughter to listen to the science because of this, this uh, emotional component. It was a novel risk to her. It was very threatening. It's all over the news. We have pretty bad measles outbreaks in Michigan because these idiots won't get vaccinated. And oh, I'm sorry, did I really say that? <clears throat> these stupid idiots won't get vaccinated. So uh, there's, and there's a whole body of work that we can talk about there and why those people don't get vaccinated. But it's important that we recognize there's just not this technical understanding of risk. You can't go in and say, I am the scientist. Trust me. I'm from the government, and I'm the scientist. Trust me. Do what I say. That won't work. There is also this emotional and cultural component of risk that is very important. So risk communication does rely on the technical expert, the scientist. You are the source of information. You are the ones who have the grounding and the technical understanding of, of risk. But it also involves the community, members of the community, leaders of the community. Sometimes we call these cultural ag agents, cultural agents, people who really are connected to the community. The farming community, the agricultural community in particular, is a community that has relies very heavily on word of mouth and cultural agents and people who've been in this community for a long time. And maybe Bob down the road at his farm had this 10 years ago, and this is how he managed it. And you know that, that knowledge base that exists is going to be very influential in how people choose to respond to these events. <clears throat> the goal is to reduce and contain the harm, obviously. And Risk communication is both persuasive and informative. It's not just enough to inform people, do X. You also have to tell them why they should do X. And you have to good, give them good reasons for doing X. So it has to be both informative and persuasive. We seek to uh, uh, pre-event. I mentioned that pre-event stage, which I wanted to talk about. So I'm going to talk about pre-event and post-event. Pre-event, we seek to change behaviors uh, to reduce risk. We get to, we want people to, you know, practice good animal uh, practices, good hygiene. Uh, uh, we want to uh, have people uh, quarantine their animals after coming back from various locations. So there are various practices that we wish to get them to put in place before to reduce the risk. Pre-crisis, we also want to develop key relationships. A crisis is a really bad time to meet people. Meet them before the, the event occurs. Know your agency people. Know those community members before an event occurs. You know, it's, it's, it's not a good idea to make, a friend, make friends during a crisis. Hopefully, you'll have those friends before. We need to prepare for the adverse events. We need to put the resources in place. 
Uh, someone was talking to me earlier about the systems we have in place uh, from uh, feedlots, is it, where should a tractor trailer turn over with hogs, we have a whole system in place to go out and deal with that. So that's really good uh, pre-crisis preparation for that particular kind of event. We have the resources, we have the knowledge, we know how to deal with it. We need to develop consensual response strategies. It's really important that we don't have different people telling different stories about what to do. Some people say evacuate, other people say don't evacuate. Uh, we, we need consistency of message and the way, one way we do that is by developing consensus before an event about what we're gonna say about X when X happens. And then we need to monitor for, uh, for the identification of risks. This is a really important question. Uh, and this is the, the next book that Tim Salnow is going to write and I'm going to put my name on. Um, <clears throat> so we've been looking a lot at these pre-crisis conditions and ways in which we can be more effective in identifying risks so that in managing them so we don't have a crisis. I mean, that's the goal. The best crisis management is the crisis that never happens because we saw the risk coming in place. We put in structures. We communicated pe with people, we educated them so the risk wouldn't emerge. But there are lots and lots of challenges in, um, uh, in emerging and how to, how to identify and manage these risks. And J Tim just took a picture of this slide. So I want you to know this is my slide. So when he publishes this, you know, it's my slide. No. It's already an abstract. It is. Post, it is. But, but I really like the talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'll share my slides with you, Tim. Uh, so risk recognition is a real challenge for, for a variety of different reasons. You know, what we see as a risk, other people may not see as risk. You know, I have been in circumstances in, in, where, you know, I look at some circumstance, I say, that is really bad. And a person who's been in that context for a long time says, no, that's just Tuesday. That's, you know, what happens here on Tuesday. It's not really bad. It isn't a risk factor. Like my daughter. Well, my, my favorite example was I was in uh, Russia many, many years ago, and I was teaching risk communication to uh, government press secretaries in Russia. And um, I was talking about the Kursk submarine. I don't know if you remember that, but it was a submarine that went down, and there were like 200 people on and they all died. You know, it was really awful. So I was talking about this, and my, the Russians, they were just like shaking their heads like they didn't understand me. And finally, I asked the interpreter, I said, you know, what, what, is, what is going on? She said, oh, Dr. Seeger, that wasn't a risk. A risk is the Siberian winter. A risk was, you know, uh, uh, World War II, where 20 million Russians died. That's a risk. This is just Tuesday in Russia, you know, when we lose a submarine and all these people. So, so it was a really good example of how a risk is really culturally defined uh, and, and what we see as a risk others may not. So there's also signal to, to noise ratio, <clears throat> which we sometimes talk about. And this is the fact that you are all so busy. You got a lot going on. You know, you've got, you've got work to do, you've got people to hire, you've got bills to pay, you've got all kinds of issues to deal with, and you've got this little nagging thing over here, this little blinking light. It's really easy to ignore that just because you have so much else going on in your life. We also have an enact, what we call enactment problems, and these were really defining characteristics in the Flint water crisis in many ways. Uh, so we have distractions, you know, we're, we're busy doing other things. The Flint water crisis occurred at exactly the same time the Detroit bankruptcy occurred. All the energy, all the attention was focused on the Detroit bankruptcy. And the governor of Michigan was an accountant. So he knew how to manage a bankruptcy. He had no idea how to manage a water system. So it was much easy for, easier for him to focus on that. <clears throat> Strong public commitments. Uh, we have all these lovely pictures of everybody standing up, drinking a toast to the Flint water with you know water from the, the the new water system with glasses of Flint water, so you have these very strong public commitments and public images that the water is safe, and then everybody tried to stick with those commitments, and then we had inadequate capacity, and this is one that certainly would be true in your case, where we just don't have the bandwidth, we don't have the resources, we don't have the people to be able to manage these risks, <clears throat> and then one that came up that <clears throat> I thought was really interesting in our group, which by by the way was the best group. I'm just saying, group four. <clears throat> Just saying. Our group talked about the fact that, you know, so often it's the lower level farm workers who really know what's going on. They're the ones who see the problems and see the issues, but they just can't get that message up because 
people aren't listening to them, they're not involved, they're not engaged. So this upward communication problem in organizations is really rampant and is one of the defining characteristics of, of missing uh, risks and crises. Pre-event planning, we've talked about a little bit. Uh, again, this is again part of a pre-event component. Just want to emphasize the incredible importance of planning and uh, how critical this is. You know, have a plan, it, buy yourself 24 hours. A plan is necessary but not sufficient. Um, work with groups to develop a plan, broad groups to develop a plan. The best plan is, uh, a planning is really a process as opposed to a product, but you do need a physical uh, form of a plan somewhere. Pre-event planning is critically important. So let me talk a little bit about post-event just, just quickly. Uh, designated spokespersons and channels and methods for communicating so we know when this bad thing happens, Bob's going to be the spokesperson, Mary's going to be the spokesperson, Bob and Mary have been trained, we know what the key messages are so that we, we don't have to develop those uh, during a crisis. We need to promote understanding of the crisis, we need to promote cooperation among the agencies. It's always great when the agencies fight with one another around a crisis, isn't it? You know, we have people struggling and, you know, FEMA and the states are arguing about who's responsible. I mean, that's really, really uh, unfortunate. And then recognize that in any crisis, I'm, again, I'm sorry about this. There's nothing I can do about it. In any crisis, these questions of cause, responsibility, and blame are going to emerge. So you need to be prepared for them. You're going to get those questions. You know, who caused this outbreak? Or why didn't we catch this outbreak earlier? Or what caused this? So that needs to be something you think about in advance. <clears throat> also, uh, post, post event, I want to talk a little bit about how to get people to do things. And in order to get people to do things, to take actions, we need to explain them to them. We need to say what we are doing, what the agencies are doing, how we're managing these events, why we are doing that, why are we taking these particular actions, what you should do, why you should do it, what others were doing, for the, for, because the first thing that will happen in a crisis is we're going to look to see what our neighbors are doing. Are our neighbors culling their herd? You know, are our neighbors taking these protective actions? And if they're not going to do it, you know, I, I don't know that I'm going to do it. So we're going to look to see what others are doing. And then, and then how should I do it? What specifically should I do? One of the primary reasons why people don't evacuate from hurricane zones, they can't. They don't have the resources. They don't have cars. They don't have access to public transportation. They can't do it. So you have to give them very specific information about how they're going to do this. So I'm going to quickly run through, uh, in about five minutes, my next 40 slides, um, and uh, talk about some of the elements of risk communication. This is a, a project that was involved with the CDC, which was re recently published in Health Security. It was really an effort to sort of outline all the, the various components that are involved in risk communication. So I want to talk about these six components quickly. We've talked about audiences here, just a couple of points about audiences. There isn't an audience, there are audiences. They have different needs, they have different uh, 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 understandings, they, they communicate in different languages, uh, they turn to different sources of information. So you need to think about messages that reflect all of your audiences and you need to take time to understand who your audiences are. Channels of communication, you know, you, I understand you had a, a discussion of channels of communication and how to reach your audiences. Different channels have different features, they target groups differently, there's different speed, there's reach. The interpersonal channel is very, very important in risk communication and crisis communication. Uh, and we have this thing called social media. God, social media. Um, which, which can be a very important resource during a crisis, but can also be a source of a great deal of misinformation during a crisis. So the most important thing about uh, social media from your perspective is you need to be engaged with social media so you know what's happening and so you can correct misinformation. Uh, uh, source features, again here I would emphasize the concept of credibility. And credibility is two things. It's trustworthiness and expertise. And trustworthiness is, you have my best interests in heart, at heart. You really do. You have my best interests at heart. I trust you because I know you care about me. You empathize with me. And sometimes our risk communications, our scientists, aren't so good at the empathy thing, okay? 
So uh, uh, the trustworthiness uh, the, uh, uh, is, is critical, but also the technical uh, expertise. It's very uh, unfortunate that I have to emphasize honesty in uh, source features. You know, we, we have to be honest. It's just, it's really fundamental, particularly when people are at risk. Uh, we have to be honest in what we're, what we're saying to people and, and giving them honest assessments of the risk. Message features, the timeliness, the speed, the frequency, uh, redundancy matters, redundancy matters, redundancy matters. Repeat the message, repeat the message. Simplicity, uh, you know, we, uh, I can't tell you the number of times I've looked at a crisis response strategy, and there are 27 steps that I'm supposed to take to mitigate this risk. Um, that's simply not possible. It's not possible for me to do those things. I have to have um, response strategies that actually can be understood easily and implemented. Um, Self-efficacy is uh, a very important concept in risk and crisis communication. It's the ability, the perceived ability to take some action to mitigate the harm. So I have to have the capacity to take the action. As I said in the evacuation uh, case, people don't have the ability to evacuate. I have to understand the reasons for taking those actions. And I need information about how to take those actions. And that's one place where the idea model works really, really well. Um, the idea model is an instructional communication model, and it really helps people understand how, not, not only what they should do, but how they should do it. Uh, elements of, uh, some elements of uh, uh, self-efficacy are, first of all, our experiences. Have we done this before? Have we been here before? Have we been through this circumstance before? If not, have I rehearsed this in my head? Have I thought about, you know, if there's a major disease outbreak on my farm, what I will do? And that's a really hard thing to think about, but at least it gives you some basis to, to understand how you might respond in those circumstances. What would I do if I had to evacuate my home? In, you know, where would I go? How, what would I take? You know, what would I do with the dog? Um, you know, how, how would I manage all these things? So that vicarious rehearsal, getting people to think about what they do can be really important in self-efficacy. Persuasion is important and also psychological arousal. Our, our major problem in getting people to take uh, actions is, is just getting their attention. You know, because there's so much going on, even, often even during a crisis, that getting them to take an action really is, a, is, a, is one of the biggest challenges. And then cultural factors, we know that older people perceive risk differently. They have larger experiences, and so they may perceive risk in a, within a larger context. Women typically perceive risk very differently than men. Uh, women are more open to risk communication messages generally than men. Context matters, the specific context where we're talking about uh, a risk communication fat matters. Race, class, and culture, um, there are groups in this country who have had historically very challenging relationships with the government, and they don't trust the government. And when the government comes in and says, oh, the water is safe, and uh, that hasn't been their experience, and they're not going to believe that. Um, and then cultural beliefs about risk. You know, what, what, is, what is our community, how has our community managed these risks in the past? Some of the uh, ongoing challenges with crisis and risk communication are, first of all, uncertainty. Again, I'm sorry, these are uncertain events. You won't have all the answers. You will still have to communicate, and you'll have to communicate quickly. Social media has really changed the whole landscape of crisis and emergency risk communication. You have to engage in social media. A clutter, you know, informational environment is so overwhelmed. Risk fatigue. You know, I'm so tired of hearing about these things. I hear about it constantly. You know, all you can talk to me is gloom and doom. I don't want to hear about it anymore. So I get, I, I'm not uh, uh, willing to accept those messages anymore. Rumors and fake news, man, this has created challenges for us. And again, the anti-vaccine idiots are, are a real place where we see that challenge. And then social amplification of risk. We're worrying about the wrong things. We, we spend a great deal of time worrying about measles and we don't worry about, you know, the other bad things that, that really are much more substantive risks that we face. So um, as Doc Allison, my veterinarian, used to say, shit happens and it smells like money. And, uh, you know, I, I do say that, 
you know, a crisis right now is kind of a growth industry. There's so much out there. Our systems are so complex. There's so many interactions that occur. This is a growth industry, and it's really one of the most important uh, uh, capacities you will have is how to manage a risk or a crisis. Um, the key, to, from my perspective, of course, to managing these is to communicate. So more information, more messages, the right message to the right person at the right time, through the right channel, with the out right outcome is your key to managing these events uh, quick, uh, effectively. <clears throat> I do like to throw this slide up. A lot of these aren't necessarily events that are related to you. But this is just an example of some of the bad things that have happened and have been, some of these are historical events, some of these are relatively current events. But crisis is part of our world, it's part of our society. In fact, crises are some of the primary factors of social change in our society. And I do like to remind people that we had this little thing called the 1918 pandemic influenza. We don't really know how many people died. Uh, most estimates are that somewhere around 300 million people died worldwide. That was a big deal. And um, so this is the thing that worries public health. They're very, very concerned about another uh, uh, influenza pandemic like this. So there are some really um, dark moments on the horizon. And we need to be very vigilant and, and think about how we're going to manage those risks and respond when they occur. <clears throat> so I have one minute left. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Um, again, I've, I've been doing this work for 40 years, and I have, I have lots of stories. Yes? So uh, my example is the pork board has like, you know, like your, your, your pork supply plan, and it's like yay thick, and a producer sees that and goes and blanks out. Yeah. And one of the things in there is, you know, what's your plan for crisis communication? How do you get through? So one of the things I say is, you know, a plan that's this big is not a plan. Um, because people won't be able to implement it. So a plan needs to be like this, and it needs to be about 24 hours. And really, the best plan is the plan that's never taken on the shelf, off the shelf because people have internalized it. So I really like to emphasize the planning process. I like to say planning is a process, not a product. And what you do through the planning process is you train people, you help people understand the risks they face, how they can mitigate those risks, and, and through the planning process involving many stakeholders in the planning process, you can really create a capacity that doesn't exist. So, you know, again, a plan that's that big, that was probably written for an agency or written for a government requirement or for insurance purposes, it's almost impossible to implement that. So get your plan down to what am I going to do for the first 24 hours? And that buys you the time necessary to make the decisions. Yes? Um, one of the things that um, <clears throat> happens with, even if it's not a zoonotic disease, if you do have a big animal disease outbreak, and hopefully we're going to track them out, I have a better biosecurity. Uh, but um, is the worried well, mm -hmm. and uh, the, how they impact, you know, kind of hospital <coughs> capacity sure. and all sorts of things like that. And I think that often takes people by surprise for so yep. Have yep. So the worried well is a phenomenon where people who aren't actually affected, you know, see some symptom and you know report to the hospital and overwhelm the hospital because you know they believe they have this awful disease, you know, measles or whatever. Part of that process is really describing to people in detail what the symptoms are and then giving giving them very specific actions to take. So, you know, if you if you have the measles right now they tell you not to come to the uh, to the emergency room. They don't want to see you. Um, so that's really specific information that, you know, sort of uh, intercedes with that worried well phenomenon. Um, it, it is an ongoing problem in, in most public health emergencies, the worried well. We also have the problem of volunteers in public health emergencies where they descend, you know, uh, in natural disasters to help. Yes? I just wondered if you had an opinion on anti-backers. <laughs> no, none whatsoever. You know, I, I think sadly we have we have really undermined the principle of credibility among our public health professionals and other professionals. We've we've done a really good job. Part of this is around climate change. We've done a really good job saying, "Oh, that's a hoax. It's a hoax," and and now we don't believe scientists anymore. And and it's true in a variety of different contexts. 
not just in climate change, it's true in public health, it's, it's probably true with some of the communities you face. Certainly in the Flint water crisis, there are people I talked to who said, look, I am never again going to believe that the government, when the government tells me this water is safe. I'm never going to believe that again. And it, it, we will have a whole generation of people in Flint who never use tap water because they, don't, they will never trust that the government's statements that the tap water is safe is true.